My name's Steve Feltham, full-time hunter of the Loch Ness Monster, and you're listening to the Unbelievers Podcast. In the 1980s, many Christian organizations and churches became very concerned about the increased influence the devil seemed to hold over an entire generation of impressionable youth. This rising paranoia became known as the Satanic Panic. What began as a fight against heavy metal music for its demonic imagery and overt sexuality quickly spread to other forms of media, such as films and television and even comic books. But did you know that there was even more insidious method for introducing anti-religious rhetoric to children? To Tonight, the Unbelievers Podcast are back to talk Beazle Bob as we once again blow the lid off of the Devil's Toy Box and discuss the sequel to the Phil Phillips bestseller. So get ready to scream for Skeletor because it's time for Turmoil in the Toy Box 2. Right here in the program, we continue to learn to unlearn everything you know. Hello and welcome to the Unbelievers Podcast. I'm Russ Ryan, and joining me as always is Drea Mora. Hello, Drea. Hey, what's up? What is up? And of course, soundboard engineer, engineer, and producer <laughs> Rob Oki. Skeletor, the master of the universe. I think you've been possessed by Satan, Russ. Something's going on. That intro. What would happen there? I'm stumbling out of the gate. (laughs) It's the easiest part to redo, but we will not be doing that. What is up, Drea and Rob? It's good to be back with you guys. Yeah, I'm just glad to uh, be, I think, talking about Skeletor again or something. something, I like hearing that quote. I love hearing that soundboard clip. We're going back. We're going back into the toy box. Literally, we're doing it. <laughs> now, every year we do like to cover one, it, one, some kind of aspect of the satanic panic. And that's, of course, there's not too much of that, too, but we've covered so much. Of course, Hell's Bells, part one and two, and then parts two, part one and two. Uh, that, <laughs> yeah. Th- <laughs> Those were a lot of work last year to get in that deep into the satanic panic. So this is a this is a little easier, breezy way to get through uh, an aspect of satanic panic. I dig, which is of course toys. Oh yeah, that's the most. Um, I don't know why. That's what parents are the most afraid of. Yeah, and you know, and even though we talked about this probably for like two hours at one point already, I still <laughs> think it's ridiculous that people think that toys are satanic and that. There's some sort of hidden agenda behind. So you haven't government. been turned yet, and you are the reason why. <laughs> that's, why we're, that's why we're here. That's You're why we're not here. the only reason why we have to do this episode, but the fact that this book had to be written. That's right. Tonight we will be discussing turmoil in the toy box two. Misfits, Island of Misfit Toys. That music means that playtime is over. It is time we get back to the very serious issues of toys and their influence on children from the Dark Lord, Satan, Beazel Bob, Lucifer. What's some other of his names? Beazel Bobby. Um, I don't know. I forget. Old Scratch. Oh, Mephistopheles, I guess. Yeah, Mephisto. There you go. That's a good um, one. Uh, old scratchy. Mm, I think that's what they yeah. call him. I've heard people call him that. Um, the red guy. Yep. The old red pajamas. That's his yep. who is definitely trying to influence kids. And this is a sequel episode. That is a long time in the making. Maybe too long? We don't know. But that's right. Tonight, we will be discussing the sequel to the best selling book, Turmoil in the Toy Box by Phil Phillips. And we are diving into Turmoil in the Toy Box 2. By Joan Hake By Roby. Phil Phillips. No. <laughs> what? Phil what, Phillips. What? <laughs> Look, one book Phil, and Phil lecture documentary Phil, right? was not enough. There is a lot more to unlearn about the evils of children's toy lines and cartoons. But this is written by a different person? Yeah, I'm going to note this before we start. Uh, that through reading this book, Turmoil in the Toy Box 2, I've learned that its author of the sequel, this Joan Roby, she was the editor and ghostwriter of the original Turmoil in the Toy Box. I think Phil Phillips just mm. slapped his name on it. 
Very interesting. Or maybe she used a, a pseudonym to be taken more seriously. That happens sometimes. Well, they're both real people, I believe. Nah, I like I, I my version better. Pretty sure Phil Phillips. Um, I, I think he's a. I'm pretty sure he's a Satanist now. That's why he stopped. He didn't do <laughs> oh. this, this next. No, one. he was. Sure he's like, he's you know what? These toys are actually pretty cool. Well, no. So she writes a sequel, and I think that's good because you want the sequel to have the same feel as the original. I don't know, have some continuity, and I'm excited that we get to learn more about this element of the Satanic Panic and what toys. We should be avoiding, or I don't know, should have avoided in the 80s. But this this book, the sequel, is from late 1989, 1990. So the toy lines have progressed a little. There was a need to, you know. So before we get too deep, uh, I have a few of the soundboard clips from the original Turmoil in the Toy Box. All, Ooh, okay. all from that amazing interview documentary with Phil Phillips, if you remember this, hosted by Gary Greenwald. Remember him? No. Well, yeah, Gary, Gary Greenwald guy. is the guy who said, Skeletor, the master of the universe. Yes, the king well, of the dorks. So I this guy was, he him. hosted that show and he was holding Snake Mountain, Drea, just speaking into the microphone. But yes, we remember him very well. And of course, the author, Phil Phillips, and he, remember, he had these proclamations about He Man and said, Mommy, God isn't master of the universe, He Man is. And, of course, He-Man has more power than Jesus. He-Man has more power than Jesus. But guess what? <laughs> Look, going back, because this was one of our very early episodes, I found a soundboard clip. This is like the B-side of that. Check this out. He-Man is more powerful than Jesus Christ. Right. Whoa, I we forgot about wow. that one. There we go. He-Man is more powerful than Jesus Christ. Right. Right. They're definitely That sounded just there. like the other one. <laughs> It's dope. It's like the UK Surf Remix version of that. I like it. <laughs> I like it too. I want to stick it around. Was right, snappier. right. <laughs> but that documentary and book, the original, were from 1986. And in the three years following, the toy landscape did not clean up its act at all. Turmoil in the toy box was not embraced, at least not by toy companies or kids or anyone. In fact, the devil gained even more ground in the battle for the soul of my youth. But that could change. Because now we are armed with some all new information about the devil's playthings in Turmoil in the Toy Box 2. And this book, this book starts with some very helpful stats about just how big of a problem we are dealing with. Now, Drea, in the U.S., in 1988, retail toy sales totaled approximately $9,507.5 billion, which I don't think... It's a real number. I don't think <laughs> 9,507 billion. I think they meant to say 9.5 billion. I have no idea. I can't even fathom what knows? billions yeah, are. So that, it's not a real number to me regardless. No, it, and it was a, a strange way to start this book with such a glaring error. I think they meant to say 9.5 billion. Whatever. It's a lot. A lot of money. They're making a lot of money. And there are also some great observations made in the beginning, such as this. Quote, Natural, naturally, parents want the newest, best, and most popular toys for their children. We must ask ourselves, even if it is popular, does slime benefit our children? Is shooting <laughs> blood from a plastic gun desirable, even if it is pretend? Does a child benefit from toys that blast, crackle, and pop? So what say you, Drea? Is slime benefiting the kids? Hell yeah. Nickelodeon proves that. I've given my niece slime, and I saw that smile on her face. So, <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> they love that shit. They love slime. <laughs> That sounds disgusting, though. It sounds like you, like, sneezed on your hand and wiped it on her, and she's like, ha, ha, ha. No, it was a can of slime from like, a toy store. Like it was not my stuff, slime. Right? That would have been disgusting, Drea. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised this was the first toy they went after. It makes sense. It's like 1990. Nick is coming on a scene. Slime is everywhere. It's on, it's on a Ghostbusters. A gun that shoots blood. Yeah, I guess there was a blood-shooting gun before. back then that they had a problem with. Uh, but they also, the author also has a lot to say about the good old days, stating that, quote, there was a time in our society when a child's playtime revolved around innocent homemade toys. But now, the latest trend is to release a line of toys at the same time a movie appears in theaters or a new cartoon premieres, where one product automatically provides a buyer to another. And to be fair, that this still kind of was a new concept in the 80s, that, that toy companies were finally free to just create entire lines of, of uh, cartoons and, and just uh, basically make 30-minute commercials. That was it's like a very new concept still in the 80s. Yeah, and I mean, I think it's kind of a 
brilliant strategy. I don't see anything really you know, too wrong with it, too underhanded. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, they knew we need to read on. You, you have to figure this out. Yeah, Ronald Reagan definitely opened that door. That was one of the first things he did. Was uh, As long as the- it's entertaining, as long as the shows are entertaining for children, that's the purpose for yeah, them. Yeah, like if, if that's and, what it was driven towards is just to create that franchise and everything, then like, yeah, that's yeah. smart. Yeah, honestly, it's just, it's it, like Dre just said, it's just smart. That's just business people, doing business people type thing. Yeah, it was the 80s. Things were booming. You could just sell kids anything. But the author's big concern with this new fad in kids' toys is that, look, like she said, she 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 wants to harken back to a day of homemade toys because Stick it, uh, uh, she's saying that kids at this time, that their imagination is undisciplined, leaving their minds ripe for the plucking by Satan and Bezelbob and all those other great names from earlier. And I found this next quote to be a bit of a throwback to the original doc where she says, imaginative play that is not focused on exploring the real world is called vain imagination. When involved in vain imaginative play, children often exalt themselves above God by pretending to be characters which they believe to be more powerful than Jesus. He man has more power than Jesus. All right, we know, Phil. So yeah, she's already hearkening back. That that line has stuck with them, man. That is a, uh, I don't know. But maybe she's onto something. Now tell me what you think. Because here now, this was the first ever commercial for this famous toy line. <laughs> the big guy with the muscles. Here's He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Skeletor is his enemy. He-Man, He-Man. If He-Man, Skeletor, and Castle Grace go, you have to put the castle together. You're doomed, He-Man. Oh, yeah? Watch this action, Dad. Now I have the power. He-Man and Skeletor each sold separately. Castle Grace Girl also sold separately from the Masters of the Universe collection from Mattel. Yeah, so he's got the vain imagination power, and he just overtook his own dad. He's, he shows him his dad somehow picks, dude, they have to set it up. They're like, this is Skeletor. <laughs> he is He-Man's, uh, I love the music, though. I had to Some just- 44-year-old guy out there just got so excited hearing that and recognizing it from when I was a kid. He-Man. Who's the big guy <laughs> with the muscle? That's He-Man. Yes, yeah, so I remember him. And she oh. said that this that these toys did not involve realistic situations because most, I mean, like, Kids fighting their dads. It's like that happens all the time. Yeah, it's almost like an archetype that they're kind of playing out here. Like, dad's like, oh, what's going on? And he's like, no, I have the power, dad. And you're you're on your ass. <laughs> like, he does knock his dad on his ass. His dad's holding skull. So like, whoa, what happened? Oh, he's like, no. hey, <laughs> Take care of your mother, son. Old commercials are awesome, though. It is <laughs> like, this, it, this episode is not just a nostalgia grab, but... We are kind of digging into the member berries here. I don't mind that some part, of these yeah. Oh, and we're learning a lot too. And we definitely, I think, some attitudes about uh, these toys are going to change. Because we also learned that there are three types of toys in the world. No more, no less. And those three types are occult, amoral, and Christian toys. That's the only <laughs> three that can exist. So occult toys are those that teach witchcraft, violence, sex, and humanism. Amoral toys are toys that do not teach morality, either good or bad. These are things like baby dolls, trucks, cars, educational toys that teach alphabet, numbers, and stuff like that. And then you have Christian toys. And those are toys that teach Christian principles and instill moral values in a child. And that is, uh, well, that is good to know. Like what? I was going to need my notebook tonight. Well, I mean, I would love to hear some examples of that last category because I'm scrambling. Um, I can actually give you one now uh, from the book, Turmoil in the Toy Box 2. At the very end, they do give you some great suggestions of actual Christian toys. And uh, there's one here. Uh, It's called Born Again Bunny. And it says... (laughs) Born Again Bunny doesn't have a Saturday morning cartoon show to help boost sales. However, the company that created him thinks that the 12-inch white rabbit has a special appeal for children. He is part of the Prince of Peace sets and comes with his own New Testament verse attached to his ear. Oh, wow. His ear? His ear. Yeah, he's got a great New Testament verse on there. Oh, so the the bunny's got a pierced ear, so it's okay to defile the cat's body. Damn it, the bunny's body. Why do I keep saying cat? cat, Cats are not bunnies. I know. Bunnies are not cats, Jay. They're different types of animals. I'm having a stroke. Oh my goodness! I can't say the right words. <laughs> well, they're similar. If, like, they're if you're drunk enough, they're basically bunny. the same thing. <laughs> they both have the same amount of syllables. <laughs> they start with the same letter. So, born again, buddy. That's just one example of a Christian toy. But well, it's good to know that there's three different types. We don't have to worry about the amoral or the Christian toys. That is okay. not our concern here. We are getting into the occult toys, and it's about time. 
And so here's a quick review of some of the toy lines that the original Turmoil in the Toy Box considered to be a cult in nature. They, uh, they uh, mentioned the Care Bears. Uh, well, Care Bears... Weird. Oh, what? Like, they're so nice. They're such they're promoting just nice such Christian little bears. Values. Yeah, like, be nice to be, care about each other. You know, be what nice. Is bad? How are they mad at the fucking Care Bears, yo? Well, like, I'll what? tell you why. They, uh, they employ a subtle interweaving of three ingredients, humanism, magic, and Eastern religions, which play an intrinsic part in the storylines of the cartoons and the books. Do you guys remember how an average Care Bear story even played out? Mm, I mean, not real. I didn't watch it because I thought they were lame. But I think it was like a kid on Earth had some kind of problem, and the bears were up in the clouds, and he could sense it, and they would yeah, they're send. like they they are like aliens. They are like alien like angels, bear uh, yes. angel beings. Yeah, that's yeah, right. If anything, they came from above, not from under the ground. <laughs> you know, now that you start to pull it apart like this, they are a little weird because they are kind of angelic. But they're bears. <laughs> but I don't know why they're they so They all represent at that. different pagan symbols. So, but the problem with Care Bears is that Sun? magic is often involved. Care Bears emphasize feelings that are not based on commitment. And also, what? the Care Bears <laughs> fight back with the Care Bear Stare. And that is a power beam the that comes Care from Bear their stare. stomach. And those who practice Eastern religions believe that the person is most powerful when all energy is focused at one central point of the body. The Care Bear power beam is the same exact concept. Wow, they are really reaching. See, this is what happens when when you live in a time period where you have no internet and you just have to <laughs> fill your time with other shit. <laughs> like, okay, I'm going to find something to be super obsessed about and write angry books about that affects nobody. That the, wow. the what is it called? What's the beam called? The Care Bear, the Care Bear stare, stare is what they the Care Bear are. Stare. Absolutely, that's the demonic thing about them. That's what is pushing it. That they, they do stare. the Care Bear Stare. Um, the names of the Care Bears. I just looked them up just because I was wondering, like, what which ones are the occult sounding ones? What's connected here? They're just like they're Grumpy Bear, Bedtime Bear, Cheer Bear, it's Lucky Bear, bear or something, Tender yes. Heart Bear, Wish Bear, Share yeah. Bear. Good luck, bear. Well, none of these are bad things yet. Um, well, birthday bear, friend bear, love a lot bear, baby hugs bear. Um, and it just continues. They're in the clouds shooting stares at people. They, are, the they, do, have, they do have them, but they get in fights. Whatever. <laughs> so, yes, that, that is one of the first ones that the original went after. But also the Smurfs. The Smurfs are users oh, yeah, of the occult as well. Okay. And it's pretty about. obvious that you got Papa Smurf and his use of magic to solve problems, uh, to go on with a plot point. There's a lot of magic. There's Gargamels and all kind of black cats. Plus, they're all things blue, going on. Which is the which interesting Smurf. that you went after <laughs> Papa Smurf before First, Gargamel yeah. there, Russ. I don't know what that says about you. Well, because he is a, he's he's seen as the problem solver and he does int- use a lot of magic. Because oh, he's, he's like, like the, the good elder, guy. He's like the wizard of the, the Smurfs. Uh, I think he, I believe, yes, he is. Uh, all right. I he's see definitely a focus there, of the but... occult in here. But also, My Little Pony, that falls under the same category, uh, given the appearance of being very cute while having like all these magical themes and horses with horns protruding from them and sometimes even changing into dragons. Do they have they, horns though? They change to dragons? The author seemed to have a big issue with My Little Pony at the time, but that was that was kind of more the girl side of that. But of course, <laughs> on the boy side, you've got He-Man and G.I. Joe. And He-Man, we have covered, but we haven't talked much about G.I. Joe. And you gotta admit, Joe. Cobra, they've got a lot of snake iconography and they are also a terrorist organization. Uh, and yeah, I did want to read this quote enemy. about the Joes. Quote, Besides glorifying was the G.I. Joe cartoon suggests that people who have foreign accents or who are disabled, disfigured, or inhuman should be suspected as enemies. These are the kind of individual that Joe fights in his cartoon. Joe never tries to change or convert his enemies. The only way he deals with them is to fight them or kill them. Cartoon Joe's attitude is best typified by this segment recently seen on the show. One of the animated heroes beats up a half dozen terrorists. Quote, has it ever occurred to you that there might be an easier way to settle disputes? One of the hero's sidekicks ask him. Yeah, the hero replies, with a gun. <laughs> so their analysis is that peace is never an option with G.I. Joe at, at all. That it's just like nonstop violence. I will personally come to your house and kick your ass. <laughs> That's a good one. Here, here's the issue I have. I feel like it's it doesn't matter what they did. Like, damned if they do, damned if they don't. If they had tried to make peace, they would have been like, oh, look, see, see, they're making friends with with terrorists, you know? 
I guess like, so. What do you want? Yeah, it does seem like a very clear case of like good and evil and Ronald Reagan time and hoorah America. Yeah. Where that was just, <laughs> uh, but the, you know, this is this is the toys and violence going to kids at the time, and there there that was someone stepping up. There. You know, there's not as much occult. Uh, as, Besides, well, I guess Cobra and all those, like a bit of a cult and magic playing and stuff going it's on. It's so funny. It, it like reminds me of the same shit that happens today. Like, it really is so similar to like, you know, the people, the, the, some of the, the people on, online. Right. But know? this is real. Now yeah. it's real life. But back then you could only get mad at the toys. Now, oh, no. People I mean, think have about to deal with things uh, in reality. When she, when you mentioned the My Little Pony thing, it's like, oh, man, I wish that they, I mean, I hope maybe she's still around to see what, Horrors have been wrought by current My Little Pony stuff, sure. like the bronies and the horrible, unspeakable art. You mean, if you can call you it mean that, all the guys that want to fuck the yeah. My Little Ponies that you're yeah, talking about, talking about like the uh -huh. Chris Chans and the bronies uh, situation. Sure, I mean bronies and the, like there's different. I know there are different, different levels. There are some bronies that are uh, on the level up. It, it. I don't care like if I'm judged for saying it. It's a little weird if you're a grown man and you enjoy watching My Little Pony. Oh, I'll it be might... judged more. I, I fully think it's very weird. Potentially even a red flag. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Potentially yeah. evil or a black flag. We don't know. <laughs> but all this sprouted out because of that 1981 deregulation where the stations can now play as many commercials as they wanted. That paved the way for toy makers to just develop cartoons. And the Smurfs, they were the, actually the first billion dollar earner in the toy and cartoon world. They quickly followed wow. by He-Man. But did you guys know what the first ever toy commercial that was specifically targeted at kids was? And I'll give you a hint what toy this is. I'll give you a hint. It's from the 1950s. Oh. Uh, oh, 1950s. oh, oh. Um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. A hula hoop. Okay. Drea says Rudolph. Rob says a hula, hula hoop. hoop. <laughs> well, let's hear it and see. This is the first toy commercial which played on the Mickey Mouse Club in 1959. And gloves and all the gadgets, gals adore. Barbie dressed for swim and fun is only three dollars. Her lovely Barbie? fashions range from one to five dollars. Look for Barbie wherever dolls are sold. Someday I'm gonna be exactly like you. Till then I know just what I'll do. Barbie, beautiful Barbie. I'll make believe that I am you. you can oh, tell that's so dark. Tell. It's swell. Yeah, wow, they have come a long way since that. That was a very, very slow and, and plotting commercial. Now they're making a whole movie. Did she say, I'll make believe that I love you? Is I'll make that believe I am, I am you. you. It was kind of instilling oh, that so a concept <laughs> of that vain imagination uh, very early on from the first ever marketed commercial specifically designed for kids on TV. Oh, yeah, I would say it's even a, a step more underhanded than that because it's like, uh, it, it starts with that whole, well, the way advertising is meant to do is to make you feel uh, inadequate, to make you feel like you're less than and that there's something else you should be aspiring to and it's this unattainable image. Oh, for sure. But <laughs> Rob, play clip three. Now we're going to jump to the 80s and now we have great commercials with jingles like this. Switch on Charger Tron, robots like you've never seen. Switch on Charger Tron, supersonic machines. Rev the meter till it's red. Launch out the tracker. Switch on Charger Tron, now it's an attacker. Switch on Charger Tron, always changing, rearranging. He's surprising. He's disguising. Charger Tron. Charger Tron. There's Protagatron and Antagatron. He sold separately from Buddy L. Fuck yeah, Chargatron and his friends, <laughs> and Togatron and Protagatron. That's a fucking bop right there. That was fun. That was, that was a lot really of fun. fun. <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> I, was, I was surprised by how much I liked the the wordplay and, and just <laughs> all of it. Everything about it was great. I got uh, right into it. I want a Charger Tron. I don't even know <laughs> yeah. what it is. I want one. They're but. great. They're like little cars <laughs> that just run into each other and they move up like uh, they're, they're like early Tron. battle bots or something. Oh, I was like, yeah. Uh, proto transformers. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, but, I love it. So that was, you know, that commercial was definitely more with the times. But that isn't to say that Barbie didn't keep up with the times as well. Because as Drea said, there's even a very much anticipated movie coming out soon. Barbie is still a hot property, but Barbie was definitely mixing it up in the 80s. So much so that this book felt the need to include the lyrics to a song called Doing the Barbies. Are you guys familiar <laughs> with this track, Doing the Barbie? 
I'm so happy to say that I'm not. Well, yeah, you I don't are. Know. I don't think that you can do that. I don't think she has the right. She doesn't have the holes. She's just. She Let's get familiar have, with she's it. Unequipped. <laughs> nope. We're gonna hear. She's it. no My Little Pony pillow. <laughs> Right, to the Barbie all over, all over town. It sounds just like every 80s pop girl in that. And there is even a video of Paula Abdul p- performing this song on MTV oh, Dance. Of course. Okay. That, that doesn't surprise Abdul. me. If Paula Abdul put her name on it, you know it was good. Um, I don't know. In my opinion, <laughs> I prefer Chargetron. That's just me. Yeah, okay. that is a little bit. I It just had more going for it. I could just picture like the, the table meeting and they're just like, all right, we need a Madonna like <laughs> song. Cindy Lauper, Madonna, we need something. What do you guys got? They're like, uh, this? Oh, yeah, it's <laughs> Debbie Gibson, perfect. Tiffany. It's perfect. And even in this, like, <laughs> it's almost like a commercial on MTV Dance where Paula Abdul's dancing around. They're showing the dolls dancing around. It's like, oh, that's it's definitely like, a commercial. Yeah, Drea definitely loved this when she was a kid. She, oh, yeah. I mean, must, I, like I said, I, I totally heard that song before and I danced to it a lot. Um, I did, I did have Barbies. Um, I did. I didn't like one of them. She was always what does that the, the step. <laughs> she was the stepsister that everybody was mean to because she was just like she had. I don't know. I just gave her the worst clothes. I didn't like her hair. Oh wow! Uh, that was all. I just didn't like how her hair looked. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Uh, she came with these ugly ski outfits, so I'm like, ew. Yeah, you're the unpopular friend. Get out of here. Yeah, Barbie's Jeez. whole angle is th- those outfits. I, even reading that book, I actually learned that uh, at one time, like the third or fourth biggest um, like producer of women's clothing just exclusively made Barbie clothing. It was like the fourth wow. or fifth top clothes producing thing was just strictly for Barbie clothes. So, yeah, yeah it's wild. But with all this attention being paid to Barbie in this book, I was hoping they'd find some kind of a cult angle or some evil. They did not. Uh, but... <laughs> The problem with Barbie can be summed up with this quote. It says, quote, Parents must realize that Barbie emphasizes physical perfection in an unrealistic manner. Children should not grow up expecting to be beautiful. Instead, (laughs) instead they should be taught that nationally, very beautiful women make up a very small percentage of the population. They need to know that most women are average, but equally accepted in the eyes of God. That's the way that they said it. They could have, you know, they could have taken a whole different angle. <laughs> but instead, they're like, don't anticipate ugliness. Just prepare for more ugly, okay? They're like, God there's not ugly. even that many hot chicks out there. So <laughs> it's, not even true. Yeah, <laughs> it's, like, it's a small percentage of what's out there. So <laughs> don't get too just excited. Give up. It, 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 it's evil to want to be pretty is evil. I was, I was with them for like most of it. And then... It started changing lanes, and I was like, all right, I'm exiting here. Well, no, maybe they'll pull you back because I didn't finish it. It goes on to say, it needs to be stressed that average is okay. It is more important that they focus on their spiritual lives rather than on their physical appearance. It would be far better for a child to play with a regular baby doll and pretend being a mother. Oh, it, yep, lost me again. Yeah, I was going to say, even when making a good point, she totally misses the landing right there, being like, just oh, worry no. about breeding, woman. Don't worry about being pretty or beautiful or Barbie. Yeah, I never, I just never had that maternal instinct with like, I mean, I liked things that were miniature, so that was the most that I liked about baby dolls, but I just didn't ever feel like, oh yeah, I'm going to push this baby around in a stroller and, like, what, run errands? Like, what do you... That didn't make sense to me at all. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My niece is going to be real cool with when she wants Malibu Barbie. I'm going to say, no, here's this regular baby doll. Yeah, Take right. this and enjoy <laughs> it I only give out much. Now be amoral toys <laughs> like this. Maybe, I don't know. I can't even tell if that's supposed to be amoral or Christian toy. I'm guessing it might even Kids fall a Christian toy. don't want regular baby dolls. They want the fun stuff. They want the good shit. This they is, want slime baby and they whatever. They want slime. Give me the slime. Look, I like the amoral <laughs> Toys, the ones that are like, uh, the, like you know, the Discovery Store. I don't know if that still exists. Yeah, sure. But they would have like, yeah, like a like little mini chemistry sets and like little projects of things you could make, of like little things that would fly with propellers and shit like that. Like, 
that's great. That's the direction. That's you a great be immoral toy for stuff. sure. Learning things. Yeah. Right? Fall I'm under surprised. That. Do they have like a whole book about like candy being evil too? Like, Hold they on. Just that's next season. That Spoiler. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. But <laughs> they do get back to the occult and boys toys though uh, with a chapter on techno violence and the occult. What are techno violent toys? This book seems to really enjoy them. Techno violent toys are robots. Why don't they just say robots? Robots. Some which of these robots (laughs) Robots. possess occult powers, specifically the ability to alter physical objects through force of will. And this ability suggests intelligence and the ability to reason and act on free will. And the (laughs) the book states, these characteristics, however, these are normally reserved for God, man, angels, and demons. Not (laughs) robots. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, it's just so, so, so funny what they get their feathers in a ruffle about. Like, I guess, okay, they don't like the idea of uh, an an inanimate object having agency. Having agency, right. Well, they say that it suggests that the Eastern mystical concept of a universal life force is true, that this is somehow connected to the universal life force that we're giving sentience to, you know, creating machines. And this prepares children to believe that science and technology are the ultimate powers in the universe. They're pretty up there. They're looking at yeah, well they're yeah they're looking at the Elon Musk's like the, he was definitely <laughs> watching like Robotech or something. It's such a weird range Probably of true. things. It's such a strange range where it goes from like Care Bears to robots. Like <laughs> what is what is safe? There's nothing that's safe that's not considered not j- just the evil from born again people. bunny. The born again bunny is the only thing so far we've heard of that they are saying is good. And what the fuck? Even no one's ever heard of the born again bunny. Yeah. Like the worst energizer bunny ever. <laughs> Sounds terrible. What happened to originally was he wears badass bunny before he was born again. Like, is there like <laughs> Oh, Basil Bub's bunny? Basil bunny, yes, definitely. Yeah, he used to be a cat, <laughs> as we learned earlier. Yeah. But but if you're keeping score at home, I just want to say all robot shows should be a no-go. I know we have unbelievers with little ones out there, Amelia, Jude, Brendan. Keep those Name all of our listeners who have kids right now. Uh, Keep going. The list goes on and on. on. (laughs) These are just recent babies I'm thinking of. Uh, So so keep the kids away from Robotech, Transformers. And man, I hate to say this. It almost falls under this techno version. Ghostbusters also, which was very um, big at the time. Uh, They use a lot of technology. But that That Ghostbusters... Ghostbusters is so obvious. I don't yeah. even know why they bother mentioning it. It's about he ghosts. He literally got a blowjob. And monsters. Yes, it's yeah. spooky blowjobs and monsters and busting. It's like you don't need to. We bustin', know. Busting. Oh, my God. That's the cue. We can do it and it makes sense. Yes, yes. finally. That's pretty yes. safe. Yes. But yeah, that, that's, that's a no-brainer. As far, yeah, it's great to hear that again, too. It's not even <laughs> Halloween season. We're busting. But now we're going to get to the big concern of author Joan Hoek Roby. This is a cartoon and toy line that is not only mentioned in this book, but is one that she felt compelled to release another entire book dedicated to. This is a big one. Uh, play the next clip. Sorry, 90s kids. So yeah, Joan Roby, she felt the need to release a book titled Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Exposed, a Critical Analysis of the TMNT. And I got to ask, how do you guys feel about the turtles? Big fans? I heard you singing along there. (laughs) Big fan. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. I just, I still see a lot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles stuff. Um, It's not like I look for it, but it's just a, I think it's a well-beloved you know, section of that that people just sure. it's got great art. You know? Just yeah. like Barbie, they have a new film coming out too. I went and saw the uh, Super Mario Brothers movie, and they played a trailer for the new uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Before that, it looks yeah. kind of fun. It looks kind of fun. Is you know the the original the original movie from when we were kids, when I was a kid at least. Mm. Um, that is really a staple of my childhood. So yeah, you're that bitch, Danny. 
Well, you're gonna. <laughs> I, that's why I gotta apologize. I'm glad we're moving in the toy lines you guys were into uh, because she really gets into it. She so. This is a very short book, this Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Exposed. It's only 75 pages. Uh, almost only. As if, <laughs> almo almost as if she is grifting off the Ninja Turtle fad at the time. Uh, oh, they were fucking huge. The they turtles. were. When, like, when I, you know, I'm, I was born in 87, so by the time I was, like, playing with toys, 91, that was, like, I believe, the biggest. peak turtle time. Peak oh, yeah. turtle time, for had sure. Tons of those toys. I had all those toys. I even know. had April O'Neil on her little fucking video camera. I love them. They were that so good. That was a chase figure. It was a rare one to find, April O'Neil. It was a hard figure to find. But <laughs> So her book here, it gives the basic overview of the backstory of the turtles, which we all know, I'm sure, because they just said it in the 30-second the <laughs> intro to the theme song. But then... We find out about the problems with these turtles and why we should reject them along with Satan. Uh, the first point that is made in the chapter about crime says, The Shredder is said to be ruthless and vengeful and has a brilliant criminal mind. Should we teach our children that crime pays? And I'm going to ask you, as viewers in of that show, do you, do you guys agree that uh, Shredder uh, well, it was a brilliant criminal mind? He was an awful villain. Yeah. And even if he was considered, like, you can still say that somebody's brilliant and not good, you know? But I don't see, I don't, I don't see any messages that crime pays like, oh, yeah, Shredder won every fucking battle. He's totally, no, everybody he loves him. He's supposed to represent evil, Shredder. Yeah. Like, you're pointing out the obvious here. He's they a are. bad guy. He's supposed to be the bad guy. So, like, the fact that the turtles fight him and generally beat him, I don't really think Shredder often wins, except for, you know, more recent Just stories. for more plot points, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Obviously, he's supposed to be hated. He's like... Sharp and mean. Yeah. You guys shot that down quick. But are you familiar with the <laughs> character Krang? Yes. Yeah, well, we're, that's we're, really... So oh we're going to hear about him from the chapter on Eastern religions. Uh, Krang is the spiritual leader to Shredder. Krang speaks from his middle stomach where a demonic-like figure is visible. It's a brain, isn't he? That He's is like a him. talking like, brain. That was what to say. Is, uh, is he demonic-like? He's like a weak-voiced little brain inside of a huge body. Like That was kind of the point. <laughs> it's like Meatwad yeah. in the middle yeah. of... Uh, like Meatwad mixed with one of the squid billies. Yeah, he wasn't really... I don't think he, I've never thought of the devil or demons at all when I've seen. And him, also, do you think of him as as Shredder's spiritual leader? <laughs> I don't Not know why all. she got that totally wrong. Leader. I think I, I had to read. I had to ask someone uh, close to the show who's a big Ninja Turtle fan, and, and uh, I found out from who, them that who? Uh, the music advisor to let me know that Krang's purpose. <laughs> Craig's purpose was to provide Shredder with ET technology. He was like an arms dealer. He was like yeah, that makes yeah, more that's sense what, a little bit. Craig was not <laughs> Shredder's leader at all. Yeah, he was well, the one, he's kind of like a like an advisor in the sense of not spiritually, but like your battle advisor. Like, oh, here he, here's some new fucking yeah, here's some space way to smart them lasers I and mean, robots and stuff. I assume that like he was made by somebody because he's just like a brain in a suit. Like yeah. I, he can't make <laughs> he himself, <makes> <laughs> right? Like so, like apparently he's answering to somebody. I don't know why we're getting into this right now. It's well, we're getting really far. Into well, it. we're getting into the you know some of the problems with one of the biggest toy lines ever exists, and this is from the chapter on sex. Uh, the author what? says in the Archie <laughs> comics, April O'Neil is seen as a voluptuous and sexy female, and in the movie, O'Neil's skirts are so short, or she's wearing shorts that reveal her legs almost to the top of the thigh. Should our children see women as only sex images? How is it only sex images? She was also a very bold and daring reporter who was trying to make a very good name for herself as a professional. That's true. Yeah, she was brave enough to go down in the sewers. And and I remember she wore pants on the cartoon. I remember it was a yellow tight jumpsuit, of course. But. Yeah, that's the figuring I had. It, she was fully clothed. She was not. It. it wasn't about that with April O'Neil. She was yeah. cool. It was that she was cool. It wasn't, she didn't need to show it all off. She wasn't, I mean, she was hot in her own way, but she was just <laughs> sure, cool. I don't I remember it, the short skirts or nothing. Yeah, I don't remember her like pushing. I, I think the author was just fantasizing, like getting in her mind. <laughs> right, right. The cleavage, okay, the cleavage was a bit much, like, I'm not saying it was a bit much. I loved it, but, uh, I could see, I could see religious, religious flack being done from this. But I gotta say, well, I mean, they're not even mentioned in the movie. I know it's more about the toys, but they did kind of make it in the movie like she was gonna fuck one of those turtles. Yeah, there was some like weird flirtiness because they're making like the 
dudes, like instead of being teenagers, they were making them more to be like these bachelors. They were like, yeah, they were like college yeah. guys, the original. But I mean, I that's I prefer those, the real like weird Muppet faced, uh, <laughs> you know, full body live action turtles. Those are the ones that I really do prefer. But they they were kind of pushing it a little bit back then. I think um, they're all so including all this. Like cartoons, it's just live like the action, whole, whatever. The whole yeah. zeitgeist of the, the zeitgeist Ninja Turtles. Of turtles co- yeah, comics yeah. and everything. But I gotta say, that one seems to have been fixed recently, the April O'Neil, because I saw that April has gone through a bit of a makeover for the new TMNT movie coming out, so they kind of eliminated some of that. But another problem <laughs> she has is in the chapter called Darkness. It says, the movie, which is rated PG and is recommended for 4 to 12-year-olds, takes place in the darkness, where night action occurs. Ch- children, oh, okay. they're prone to be scared of the dark. Many evil the night deeds. Night is fucking evil now. Like now, just the nighttime is is the bad guy. <laughs> the they are really trying to blow everything out. They're, yeah, there's some. They're, they're in dark alleys in this, and like four year olds is way too scary for you them. You know, it ha- It's gonna happen no matter what they do. They can't fight the night. You can't. I'm sorry. You can't. There's certain things that you don't have a choice. What a Batman but. sequel. More can't street fight lamps. Them. That's a it's, Spider-Man. That's, cool. that's actually kind of cool. No, that was that Spider-Man play, right? Oh, the musical. Can't fight the night. Oh, <laughs> turn off the dark. I'm sorry. It was called Turn Off the Dark. <laughs> okay, cool. So, Rob, go ahead. Start writing that musical. Right. Copyright that. <laughs> yeah. Rob Oakey can't fight the night. So, yeah, the darkness is a problem. But she has a couple of ninja-related problems as well. And oh, that is geez. weapons. She says that names of ninja lethal weapons, their description and use are incorporated into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Well, yeah, of course. I don't yeah. know why. They all, they're, every picture, they all got their weapons. But now she kind of brings it back Japanese to Eastern flag. religions, though, with meditation. The ninja uses meditation to obtain love that, physical power and inner strength. Meditation is a religion that does not accept Jesus Christ, the, the Messiah, as the one true God. So she, and I got to say, I've seen enough Ninja Turtles to know that there was not a lot of meditation going on. Maybe Splinter, and maybe once they did it, but those guys were so hyper, they had no time for peace and quiet and meditating. It was not a focus. Yeah, they, I, they hated it. They were I, like, fuck that, let's go to church. I do remember a scene when they were meditating, and then I think they got distracted by pizza. Easily. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it Very happens. Easy. But yeah, no, I, um, I know people who are... Very religious, you know, Christians who meditate. Sure, it's, yeah, it's a those form of path, prayer, getting a deep prayer or something can intersect in a, a normal way that's not um, blasphemous, right? You're not allowed to have positive thoughts and self affirmations and follow Christ. It and seems just like you also can like take peace. elements of, of like <laughs> other religions that are, you know, you know, decent. It's not like it's morally. It's not like Jesus. Is like, what are you doing, sitting there, not listening to stuff? What are you, you know? I don't well, think praying it's really and like meditating that. are like brother and sister. I feel like in a lot of ways. So I don't know. This is this feels like. They're nitpicking now at this point. Yeah, I can see if they had taken the argument of saying that, like, well, they're more closely worshiping, you know, quote unquote, worshiping a rat, you know, oh, Splinter is like they're Jesus. I can see that kind of being kind of offensive to them, but they don't even say that. It's like they have a problem with the meditation. Well, what it's if so a kid weird. needs meditation? What if a, yeah, there's what if a got kid watching this meditation? that would be hesitant to try something like meditation, but then they see the Ninja Turtles doing it and they're like, oh, they're doing it. So that means that it's, it's not scary. It's not a weird thing to do. The, these people, I think, are cool are doing it. So I'm going to cool. do it. Have fun in hell with the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> or groping reporters and eating pizza or whatever. It's they're, they're going against something that could help some kids, possibly. Yeah. But yeah. Maybe open some kids up to something that, that might help them. But because it doesn't fall into their little fucking box of what they think is good. They could have stuck to the talking it. brains and the weapons and the violence and the nonstop kicking and all that. But also... In the early section of this, she touches on an element of turtle mania that crosses over with another another one of our favorite elements of satanic panic, Hell's Bells. Now, do you guys remember when the Ninja Turtles took to the road in a live-action rock and roll tour called Coming Out of Their Shells? No, I fucking wish I did. I don't remember that. Gone with, should have gone with a different name. No, they, 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 they came out of their shells. They released an album. They toured shell, the dude. country. And this checks all the boxes for the, these hardcore types, these Jones and Phil Phillips. You've got mutants. You've got Eastern religions. You've got violence. And you've got rock and roll. All, and you've got coming. All terrorizing <laughs> our, uh, our country. So out of the shells, this was, of course, a live action rock experience and album with the Ninja Turtles. And let's get a taste of this evil 
with yes. the title track <laughs> from this multimedia experience. What? When there's music inside of you, you know that someday it's got to come through. That's why we're here and we're telling you true. We're coming out of a shell, yeah. You hear the rhythm and the <laughs> move in your feet. Bob Seeger. Ain't nothing <laughs> like a song with a beat. We're coming out up like from Brett under Michaels the street. Lord, we're ready to rock. There will be no retreat. We're coming out of our shell. Whoa, okay, come on. We're coming <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that is so terrible. It's great that they got vanilla ice to help later because that is the worst. That was um not good. On, it's shockingly on a lot bad. of different right. there, Yeah, it was there like was some phrasing Bonnie there. Bonnie Raitt singing mm. Bob Seeger. It was the that was just not good. I don't know what Where's the turtles? Who was that? Was that April O'Neil singing? No, what that's the them fuck singing. They're more going to kick them. in. That's one of I the wanted turtles? to play. I wanted to play the, of course, the title track of which gets bombastic later, and they have they all play instruments and stuff. But while they were promoting this tour, the turtles from this tour were a guest for an entire episode of the Oprah Winfrey Show. And this appearance, <laughs> this appearance by the Ninja Turtles can best be described as a debacle. They start by playing the song that we just heard live with a full bound. Band. And these are these are the like the the guys movie in version, suits. Right? Yes, they, they kind of no, look like just the movie no shells because they're out of their shells. So they can move around more, play guitars. And I gotta say, I played that album version because the sound is awful when they're playing on Oprah. You can't hear the vocals at all, especially because you've got a guy, a turtle singing through a giant mask on his head. But then. They have all the turtles sit down, all four Ninja Turtles, and they get interviewed by Oprah. And here she is talking to Leonardo about his role in the band. Okay, Leonardo, Leonardo yeah. what, what instruments you play? Well, like, I play the bass, one string guitar, and it's hooked up totally awesomely to this microphone here, and I'm just jamming all the time. Hooked up remote when it's time to boogie, you know what I'm saying, it just goes all the way. <laughs> and, and you know, like, we got a new message happening, that you can do a lot more good with music than you can being violent fighting around all the time. That's right, you guys! That's cool. right. Yeah! yeah. 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 All right, a, fe a fellow bass player, Dre, he only needs one string, though. Yeah, it goes all the way. <laughs> he's That's so hyped great. up. He's on drugs. 100%. He reminds me of like what, Pauly Shore almost. Which uh, turtle do you guys think you would be? If like if we were like the Ninja Raphael. Turtles. Okay, like we'll go a full original Unbeliever squad. Throw Jude in there too. Which Who's, who's mm. who if we're the Ninja Turtles? Well, maybe Jude's Donatello because he's like, like working on machines wise. and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, uh, thinks, he, like, he like plans stuff out more. Mm. I don't, I don't know because everyone's just gonna say I'm coming because I would ask Michael Raph. Angelo. You're right. Oh, can be a rap. You're rap. Me? Yeah. All right, cool. I'll take it. That's cool. You're right. See, I, and I picked that just because he, I always thought he was the meanest. He can be. Russ is so mean sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we all have our mean streaks. No, my I'm favorite joking. was always Russ Michael Angelo. Though. But he's tough and he's a leader, so I feel like that's why he's Raph. All right, and, I'll uh, take it. That's but, not gonna be this week's poll. Which turtle? Wasn't Leonardo we're not doing that. And I don't know, Dre. I, I feel Leonardo like me and you, we could it could go either way with those with the other two. I don't think Dre okay. Leo. Um, I was gonna say uh, that she's a hard hitting bass player right there. I think that. That's <laughs> I guess perfect. that makes me Mikey, which I'll take Mikey. He was always hey, yeah. my favorite. And you yeah. love pizza. He, you do. He's everyone's. He's everyone's fucking chill, laid back, fun guy. Who is not? He's never mean. <laughs> nah, he's, a, he's a dope. He's just dope sometimes. That's all. <laughs> he's just a jokester. He's not dumb. Yeah, no, it's I, we're nothing like the Ninja Turtles. But no, I just thought that would be fun to role play. No, especially not these ones because uh, on this Oprah thing, I gotta say this show was so hard to clip because every question Oprah asks, the turtles. All start answering at the same time, and it, which I gotta say <laughs> oh, is God. is actually fairly accurate to the cartoon. Uh, like yeah. this, like this exchange. See if you can make anything of this. Here, Oprah wants to know if Shredder has given him any problems on this tour. Once or two, you've been having problems because of Shredder. I wish Whoa. you had like that. You guys, you calm know, down. Calm down. Is he here now? Calm down. Wait, well, I, don't I don't know. Is he I, here I now? He There's only been here. No. <laughs> What is he doing here? 
It's like the Mari show. I love it. Yeah, I was going to say, this is worse than Jerry Springer. It is insane. It's like a cacophony going on there. But you might have heard a female voice that wasn't Oprah because at this point, April O'Neil has joined them for this exclusive Oprah from interview. From the movie. Do we got a live action April oh, O'Neil? Not, not maybe from the movie. No, no, but, I hey, think it is the same one. As you got a live action April O'Neil with four guys in turtle suits, and things just go off the rails right here when Oprah asks April, "Does she have a favorite turtle?" Oh no. <laughs> is there is there one of the turtles you like more than the others? I mean, like, is there anything like romantic or anything? Well, what? Yeah, well, 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 be careful of that answer. Oh, yeah. April, tell them about us. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure everyone, you could, uh, the more you get to know the turtles, the more attractive they become. But Good answer. Oh. <laughs> You're just talking about me. <laughs> oh, I've been trying to talk her into an interspecies relationship for months now. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, well, she, man. And she won't do it. Huh? She can't no, hold her breath no, she can't I'm do reporter. it. The biggest it's problem is she can't hold her breath long enough, you know? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> What yeah. the fuck? What the hell was that? I'm surprised they didn't just pull the plug right there. And you, this is a video. Yeah. We will watch this on live stream. The expression on these kids' <laughs> faces is amazing. They do not... I had to soundboard clip this. I'm sorry. I've been trying to talk her into an interspecies relationship for months now. Whoa! Whoa. Whoa. You can't Whoa. say that! Whoa. Chill! Whoa! And then, then, she couldn't. then they yeah, tag she couldn't. it. They tag it with this. The biggest problem is she can't hold her breath long enough, you know? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? She, you know? can't, she can't handle this turtle dick, you know? Oh, my God. <laughs> that's just so racy. Like, yeah, that's that's too much even for me. Like, they went from sounding like a bunch of Furbies in the same room who were just like all like, oh, yeah, we're all in one course. Then it got into like that disgusting like... All right, we're talking about sex now, and it's like, no, 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 no. You can tell got this their is cold four, blood flowing. This is four guys. young. Ready to go, man. <laughs> this is four young dudes on tour, dressing up as turtles every night, and the only woman they get to actually hang with is uh, is this, this you know, she's really attractive. I mean, she's a very accurate April O'Neil, and there's like uh, the biggest problem is she can't hold her breath long enough, you know. <laughs> uh, the way and they're like fondling her cheek. It's, it's very, very no. strange. The kids are not having this, but Oprah gives. April a chance to correct the record on this. Oprah's realizing this is falling apart, having the Ninja Turtles on there. Uh, <laughs> She's like, so tell me, which one of the turtles do you have sex? No, no, with? so she gives April a chance to kind of like, well, let's, let's get this back to normal, and she does her best, but before they move on to one more question from the kids. Did you want to say something? I just wanted to say that the, seconds, one thing, <laughs> the one thing about the turtles, being, being a, a reporter, it's hard for me not to analyze. And the good thing about these guys is that they're not black or white, they're green. Okay, here's a question. What? Yeah. Um, how, if, if you live down in the sewer, is there any water comes down? Or? Well, yeah. of course there is. Oh, Lots of it. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, matter of fact, when we sublet our sewer, you know, when we left New York, the guy came in, had a real problem, dried everything out. Yeah, totally. The biggest problem is a lot of the water isn't clean, though, down there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What's so special about Splinter? Yo, dude, I think it's so. like Splinter's our dad, you know? I mean, what's so special about your dad? Whoa. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Well, he's yeah, uh, he, not a radioactive rat for one. It's like, who coached these guys to deal with kids? He, he's saying this. He's got, wait, where is it? Splinter's our dad, you know? I mean, what's so special about your dad? That kid's looking around like, I don't even have a dad. That, that, I, I, that, I, I that actually kind of liked that. That was that, Raph. I'm yeah, sure. definitely. That's why he was like a little, you know, he got a little tough with the kid. I liked that, that response. He's like, oh, yeah, because it's, it's true. It's like, well... Because he's our mentor and everything. Like, basically, it wasn't even that mean because he's like, list the things that you find special about your dad, and that will apply to what we feel about Splinter. But it was the yeah. kid, the way the kid said it, he goes, Hey, you know, Splinter, like, uh, what's so special about <laughs> that guy? He's like, Splinter's our dad, you know? I mean, what's so special about your dad? Yeah, yeah, he, like he had to stop himself from calling the kid like you little idiot yeah. at the end or something. <laughs> he's like, not an actual like turtle so though. He's just acting. He's like his Splinter is really not his dad. He can just anyway. It's like our dad. Wait, where's Splinter at? Anyway, everybody else is here. Where's Splinter? Splinter he's way too old to be on tour. Make an appearance on this, but <laughs> that little kid was so cute too. He was like, "Does the do you live in the sewer? Does the water?" Ever get down there? He's like, like, yeah, you dummy. Yeah. We're in the sewer. You watch so There's water cute. everywhere. What do you think? It's adorable. He probably so like sweet. it's probably because he wants to live in a sewer, and he's like, "Is it gonna be gross though?" I like, want to well, live yeah, in a sewer. Well, yeah, don't live in a sewer, kid. Please. Their sewer was so cool though. Like, <laughs> 
Yeah, it was like a train station, basically. They lived in like a like a abandoned train station. So this, it was this more than bit opens, this whole show opens with, um, they're talking about the Chicago sewer system. They show the turtles running the Oprah building and uh, one of them pops uh, out of the sewer and everything. They, <laughs> they, cause they, and they do three musical numbers on here. It's not, the interview wow, part, is that, I don't care about the music part, whatever, that sucks. When they're doing this interview, it, this whole thing is such a shit show. And I gotta say, we will watch the highlights on the next uh, live stream coming soon. Because the oh, audience... Goody. The audience is about 50% kids, and now it is the kids' time to shine. They go to audience questions again, and once more, the kids really want to know about who the turtles' parents are. Who was your mom and dad? Oh, good question. You know what? We don't really know. You know, like, sometimes when I'm asleep at night, I have dreams. You guys ever have dreams at night? Yeah. yeah, well, you know, like, I dream I dream of, like, being in this big bowl and, like, flakes of, you know, pet food falling on my head, but I don't remember who my mom and dad are. You know, it's like when we first said we were going to come on the show, I thought the show was going to be about, like, amphibian orphans and how they adjust, you know? Yeah. Okay, this is a question. Where are your weapons? Okay, so... These kids watch the show. They've been told the backstory <laughs> on the Oprah episode. Okay, the parents are two not mutant ninja turtles, okay? That is a waste of a question, kid. You had a chance to ask a turtle a real question. You asked the dumbest thing ever. Yeah, they were turtles. <laughs> the, our, their parents were just regular turtles. Regular ass turtles. We met some ooze. That's what happened. This may have come out between the movies, I think, possibly. Yeah. This sounds like it came out... Like the first movie came out and they were like capitalizing off of all the turtle stuff. So they were like, yeah. send them on tour. Let's make some fucking money with these things. And then like sometime, I bet you this is around when they were figuring out the oh, second yeah, movie, turtles. which is, you know, Secret of the Ooze where you, f I'm pretty sure I haven't seen them in a while, but I think that's where you find out their origin story. I think, I don't know if that's revealed in the first movie. Like I could just, my brain could just be making shit up, but I could have swore. I remember like, like animated Green. They were little guys. I do remember them like showing it. Yeah, that, like, like like in the, the intro, isn't that that shows briefly how they were like? Maybe they created. like retconned it in the second one or something. Well, that was always in the beginning. They show the because it's it's their origin story. I mean, not to get nerdy, I guess they are <laughs> oh, too late. They, we're they, already they, there. They share an the origin turtles. story with Daredevil, and that was the whole point. The creators what? love Daredevil. When Daredevil, the radiation makes him blonde. At the same time, the turtles are there. They're, they're not different comic companies, but the creators wanted to give their Thing, the same origin as Daredevil. That sounds like an origin. It's true. I, it I did not know. It depends what origin. That no, that is actually what believe. the creators they wanted that to have. Kind of him and the Daredevil has the you same. Know, basic I, origins I just as seen a picture of that right now. I was like looking up, you know, TMNT origin ooze just to see like pictures if there was in any comics or whatever. And there's there's Daredevil right yes. in front of the. I know what I'm talking about. No, I'm Who's talking about. That? So. Back to Oprah. They they have to take a quick break from the kid questions to talk to a woman. A grown adult woman with a turtle mask and a turtle nose in 1990. <laughs> and Oprah needs to find out oh, what's really going on, ma'am. You know, we got a lady in our audience who's dressed as a turtle. Is there a reason oh why? Mom! <laughs> Mom! <Mom's laughs> <Mom's laughs> Tickets to their concert. I had to dress like them, eat their cereal, walk backwards down Michigan Avenue in order to get the tickets. Turtle oh, also wear turtle underwear, underwear on my head. Oh my turtle God. underwear Woo. on my head. On your head? <laughs> you must really want to be a turtle. I like turtles. I like the sure. turtles so much, I had to get the tickets. That's happening. So that is a weird promotion, especially for an adult to participate in. She had to wear turtle underwear on her head and eat cereal and walk backwards to get tickets to this. <laughs> what do the walking backwards have to do with anything? Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. And like, how does that get you tickets? <laughs> Where, how do you sign up for something like this? Um what does she do for a living that allows her to have this much free time on her hands where she can just go doing these dumb things? She's an official, she's a professional turtle chaser. So look, this, I, yeah, I, I pulled a soundboard a clip, chaser. Rob. If you could find the roadkill clip, somehow this reminds me so much of that. I don't know why. Let's check it out. Oh, also wear turtle underwear on my head. Oh my turtle God. underwear Woo. on my head. On your head. <laughs> <laughs> do you eat roadkill? Yeah, anyway. You do? <laughs> All it needs is a turtle <laughs> laughing at her at the end there. <laughs> No, I mean, it It was pretty cute when they were all just like, Mom, yay, Mom. Like, they just knew to all join in on that. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know why. I had to uh, put this in there. I'm just keeping this just because. I like turtles. Because that is the consensus of everyone watching That's this live. I, I've got one more clip of this. And, <laughs> and here's some more questions from the kids. And April O'Neill 
making a last ditch effort to save the integrity of the turtles. I'll give it to April here. Yeah, yeah. What do you want to say? I like Donatello you too. Like Donatello. Okay. Hey, yes. Oh, yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Hey, I like you too. I like how to eat pizza. Well, I like how turtles. To eat pizza. Yeah. And why do you love the turtles so much? Because they're our friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's the reason. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because they fight good. Because they fight good. Now, see, you guys have gotten such a reputation for fighting here. No, it's true. It's true. Well, well you know, that's how we started. But that's not who we are, you know? Right. Uh-huh. I think the important, the, one of the important things is that, what, from talking to the kids, that I feel is that there's somebody that will always be there for them. Totally, somebody like that their Somebody that stands up for the kids. Somebody that doesn't judge them. Somebody that they can communicate with. But that if there is a problem, they think, what would the turtles do? Or, or the turtles could come through and help them. Well, there somehow. you go. Well, let me ask. Oh God! They, I heard what just happened. What there. were the turtles do? <laughs> so, but that I gotta say though, she is the dudes. only one keeping this tour together. I think she knows these dudes, and they're kind of off the rails. This whole appearance seems like a reaction to parental and religious outrage, much like from the turtle book exposed and turmoil. She in literally the said, too. "What would the turtles do?" She, I mean, she knows what she's saying. Like, <laughs> that was on purpose. And the whole point of this, they bring it up a lot. I didn't clip it, but they talk about the whole point of them going on this tour was that they were laying down their weapons. And picking up guitars. You know, if they're one string basses that just go on forever. <laughs> but they are, this was, seemed like a bit of an image cleanup. They're like, no. And they talk about, we don't want to get violent. We only defend ourselves and leave us alone and buy more toys. Who knew, right? That the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles would be the focus of so much religious ire at the time, this early 90s. But before we close the lid on this tumultuous toy box, the Ninja Turtles will bring it all together because not only did Joan Hoek Roby feel the need to write a book about just about the Ninja Turtles, so did Phil Phillips from the original Turmoil in the Toy Box. You remember uh, this guy? He-Man has more power than Jesus. He-Man has more power than Jesus. So Phil Phillips, he also released a Ninja Turtle-focused book called... Saturday morning control or mind control. <laughs> so he didn't write Turmoil in the Toy Box 2, no. but he wrote another book about the steam stuff that they wrote about in Turmoil in the Toy Box. Yes, he, he released an independent book called Saturday Morning Mind Control just about the Ninja Turtles. And uh, Interesting. I've got some of his points, too, as we wrap this up. We'll bring it all the way back to Phil Phillips. Uh, he makes some to uh, points about the Turtles, such as, quote, the current Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles animated series averages 34 violent acts an hour. <laughs> That's pretty good. Sounds about right. It sounds great. I want to watch yeah. that. He also says, uh, quote, the most common social group depicted on Saturday morning TV is the gang. What distinguishes a gang from a normal group of friends? First, identity with and loyalty to the gang overrides any other loyalty, specifically to family or society as a whole. Second, gang members are all within a fairly narrow age range, whether they are teens or preteens. And third, the older wizard for the group, whether it is a street <laughs> smart teenager, leading children, or an aged friendly scientist, is never a family member. Fourth, <laughs> the gang is identified by wearing a common uniform or emblem. Slogans and secret code words are often, often employed. And fifth, the gang has a turf. With the turf comes the obligation to defend it at all costs, even the cost of life. Mm, this is the Foot Clan. This is the Foot Clan we're talking about. Also, oh. the Ninja Turtles, they fall nicely into this long legacy of gang profiles, which has its origins oh. in the programs such as 1970s Yogi's Gang, Super Friends, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, and even the animated version of Lassie. Hmm. So the, these were all Phil Phillips' words here. So he Lassie. Yeah. He takes particular umbrage with the gang element and having an older wizard. I don't know a lot of street smart teenagers I would consider wizards. No, just that that role though. It's just uh, as far as like definitely the last two things that he described or you know tried to include on that list don't identify nearly as much with those points as like the church does. What gang is Lassie part of? Like what? Is he talking about? I don't know. I don't know much about this? the uh, animated version of Lassie. I didn't know there was an animated Lassie. Maybe didn't even good. know that existed. I'm not in a gang. I, I don't think Lassie was doing anything to hurt anybody. Lassie saved people. Dogs can't be gang members. All of these things are things that helped people, saved people. Like, I don't understand if it's helping people, 
is that is so your beliefs, your personal beliefs are more important than actually helping people. It seems like that's what it's, that's what I'm getting from all of this. Basically. I think it's also rejection of family is a bit of an issue because he says as a gang of four, they have a look, a code language, a mutual love of pizza, a shared religion being ninja and a wise older guide who is not part of a true family unit. So they're this literally is, siblings though. This is <laughs> the <laughs> breaking. Yeah, Jesus. actually they are. Well, like, are they? Hello. Yeah. He's their father splinter. Like he adopted them. You know, he's their, he's their guy. Phil it's, Phillips might say indoctrinated. Dad, you know? I mean, what's That's, so special about your dad? Thank you. Oh, thank you. my dad? You better watch that. <laughs> <laughs> so All my right. dad ain't shit. <laughs> All right. I'm going to read one last point from Phil Phillips regarding a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. It says, quote, every episode, er, well, sorry, early episodes of the Turtles were violent, but rather campy in their storylines and use of language. Increasingly over the years, however, the religious undertones of the ninja belief have become more obvious. The Turtles' recent movie was rated PG, but the day I saw it in a theater outside Dallas, at least half the audience in there was three to six years old range. The movie is filled with curse words, has a reporter who dresses like a hooker, and it's extremely violent. I like a Phil Phillips of pulling punches. Like, she's a hooker. And like, a hooker? Do, what does he think PG means? These kids weren't going to the theater alone. They were with their parents. Yeah, three-year-olds wandered guided. in like, and their masks and everything. They had their underwear. <laughs> oh, wait, what did they have? Oh, also wet turtle underwear on my head. Oh my turtle God. underwear Woo. on my head. On your head. <laughs> <laughs> They're so short, they could sneak right past the ticket. Window. Is she that looked like a was hooker. That, was that supposed to be her turtle mask? Was like the two holes in the underwear like pulled no, over there her was both. eyes? She had the she had a turtle mask and she had their underwear on her. Who was was this a Howard's or a Opie and Anthony stunt or something? Like who was making people go through these hoops just to go see the the fucking rock and roll Ninja Turtles? I don't I know. Some genius. That, that Oprah would go, she probably went from like you know some terrible, terrible thing the day before this. Like, they were probably interviewing someone who was, like, raped <laughs> You know, she didn't want to do this. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, this, like, or someone who's been through some terrible life experience and they're like, tomorrow we got the Ninja Turtles, so <laughs> it's gonna be a nice switch up from our normal programming. Like, it's... Oprah was so weird. Oh, she dances with him at the end, and the kids are all it's it's a crazy. We will watch more of it on the stream, but that's it. I am calling it here. That is our satanic panic for this year. I gotta say, any final thoughts on this, Drea Mora? It's silly. It's all so silly. There's definitely some things that they can be focusing on that are actually kind of, you know, seem detrimental or are giving kids negative messages. But the fucking Care Bears, dude, you know, these people are just reaching, and they're scared of everything, and I'm glad that nobody takes them seriously. Yeah, me too. And and if, if you think about it, though, they kind of won, because no one really gives a shit about toys, expes- ex- except for, like, older people oh, now. Like, kids disagree. do not care about toys. They're all about games and phones and everything else. How about you, Rob Oki? It's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's just, like, it's classic satanic panic. It is... You know, it's it's crazy that it's it's still happening today in a lot of ways on the internet for other reasons. Um, but it's it's just like it just shows people not knowing how to handle themselves. <laughs> like people yeah. people so wrapped up in their own beliefs. You know, it's like it's like that book Childhood's End where like the aliens show up, but they look like the devil. They look like demons. So like people automatically assume that they're like terrible that they're that they're here to hurt us. But it's like uh, some of these things are like these the ninja turtles are heroes they're they're good things and they, a, half show, a lot yeah. of these things the tra- the transformers are good things a very few things that they mention are even they're trying to save like, people yeah yeah they're they're there to you know inspire kids to do good things and i think they're focusing on the wrong thing you really <laughs> if they just were able to maybe broaden their view a little bit and kind of not immediately judge everything as being bad, they may actually gain something from the world and like from some of these these pieces of media. But it's true. And after you've writer. written after you've written two books about it, it's kind of hard to start, you know, opening your your views, I guess. You're you're determined and you've set yourself and you you've decided what you believe at that point. So it's it's silly though. I do think it is silly. It is and it was if you know I give him in uh, uh, whatever an A for effort for trying to stop what they, of course, had no influence on at all. And 
Look, I was just going to say, uh, be sure and answer this week's poll. What's the most evil toy? Is it Barbie? Is it He-Man? Is it the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? I don't know. What else? I'll the throw in dude. I'll throw in Chargatron. It's Chargatron, oh, maybe. I don't yeah. think anyone knows know what that is, though. He's cooler. <laughs> All right, that's it. Let's close the toy box with my new favorite song. Robots like you've never seen switch on Chargatron. Supersonic machines rev the meter till it's red. Launch out the tracker, switch on Charger Tron, now it's an attacker. <laughs> switch on Charger Tron, always changing, rearranging. He's surprising, he's disguising. Charger Tron, Charger Tron. There's Protagatron and Antagatron, each sold separately from Buddy L. Thank you, Buddy L. Yeah, that was my favorite new. Uh, new- Antagatron, too. Yeah. I love those names. <laughs> it's so funny. So brilliant, so clever. Protagatron. <laughs> Tron's a real one though. I'm I'm sticking behind him. I like. They're him like, a lot. we need. What are we gonna call it? We're go- oh, the protagonist. He's the protagonist. What do we call? <laughs> this? What do we call the other one? The <laughs> names are as lazy as the song, but yeah. it somehow works. I don't know why it works. It just does. It, work. Doesn't it sound like that? Re- it reminds me of like uh, something that like Andy Samberg would write. Like it's like yeah, Lonely it Island esque, or like you know, like what they what SNL is trying to imitate when they do like those sort of uh, right, like Big Red, like when they yeah. do those toy parodies. It does seem like a toy parody, but it, no, it's for real. And uh, it didn't get mentioned in the book, but I, I felt the need to mention it because I sat through a lot of toy cartoons and doing research for this, and that's just the best. I wonder how much, uh, what is it called? What's that thing called? The Antagatron that we just listened to? The- yeah, the main, char- Chargatron? Chargatron. Charger what does that Tron. go for on eBay, I wonder? I don't know. I haven't looked it up, man. we got to look into it. I, I definitely want to get a Charger yeah. Tron. If someone wants uh, to send us Christmas. one of those, you know, that would be <laughs> yes. a nice little surprise, you know? I'll that take it. It would definitely Tron. be a surprise. <laughs> so, yeah, so we're out of the satanic panic. Watch out for those toys. I know we got a lot of unbelievers with little ones out there. Watch out! For Charger Tron, no, not him. He's cool. But, of course, the Smurfs and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Barbie. Damn turtles, yeah. Those turtles seem like a big problem, (laughs) and they haven't gone away. But uh, let's move on to another segment. Let's get into the Unbelievers Voice Mail Bag. The Unbelievers Mail Bag. Ooh. Right in the mailbag. Hey, man, check your mailbag. Hey, you got some new mail over here. Mailbag. 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 The mailbag is cool. Mailbag. What's up, bitches? It's mail time. Woo! All right. Well, we have a... This is a quick one, but we have a uh, couple of voice mailbags. If you want to leave a voicemail, call us at 420-469-0114. What do we got, Rob? Uh, let's check out our first one here. This is from our old buddy Destin Star. Let's uh, let's give it a listen. Hey, what's up, guys? It is Destin Star. Um, I've totally forgotten about another UFO sighting, or well, the UFO encounter that I've had. Uh, me and my brother here. Uh, we were. It was like somewhere in I want to say August of 2021. We were just walking down that night. We were just walking around at night around this uh, construction area that was um, building up a new highway, I think, State Road. And we saw this this cloud, like a lot, like a lot of these clouds, just like like full of lightning. But there was no thunder whatsoever. It was just like it was just flashing light like lightning and i was trying to take a video and i couldn't help but notice uh there was a uh a what the? you make it an icy all of light uh <laughs> kind of like the same color as like lightning yellow it was like i mean it was, it was all lightning yellow like lightning and all that stuff but um anyways before i start going on with that but it, it just like yeah it was pretty much like a ball just like coming out and at first I thought it was a plane but then it just decided to go back into the storm like it came out of the uh of the uh lightning clouds but then goes back in and that's pretty much it I I'll go into more detail probably on the discord channel but um yeah that's pretty much it oh, okay and um, plug in the discord lost my cool all right, thank you. That was Destin Star chiming in with that one. 
That was Destin Starr, yeah, with a little bit of a weird UFO experience. That, that, he that saw. was the weird weather. Right? We were thrown to the weather. We got weird heat lightning clouds <laughs> happening. Balls yeah. are flying into clouds, ladies and gentlemen. It sounds like there was a mixture of things going on there. There may have just been lightning happening, which I think is a strong possibility with also, you know, he said he saw a ball come out of it. Mm-hmm. And that could be, you know, there there's ball types of lightning. heat lightning that are balls. Sounds weird, but it, I think that it ball also could be Ball lightning is also a thing. There's a lot of, like, uh, especially being a topic lately, there's fake, there's these fake videos of ball lightning, like going by a railroad track that got a lot of, oh, uh, yeah. that was shared a lot, but it was turned out to be fake. But people uh, blame a lot of uh, weird orb stuff on ball lightning, but uh, maybe he was seeing something. It could have been a natural thing, or it could, maybe he did see a UFO. Um, it's you know tough to say. I, yeah, with those we sort of things, I like to think of it as like, did it feel like it was sentient? Did it move like with purpose? Did it move like so, it felt like someone was driving it, or it was like uh, almost like when you look into a microscope and you see the way that like bacteria moves with like a sort of sentience to it. Um, yeah, that's like, a good it, point, Rob. Was it techno violent like uh, the toys we were talking about? Who knows? <laughs> no, that's not. That's different. But it, it, basically, like I think he may have seen. Something. It sounds like he saw something. Who who knows? Yeah, it's too bad he couldn't uh, get video of it. Yeah, go to the Discord, I guess, if you want to get the real story on that. We have another voicemail, too. Thank you, Dustin Starr, for chiming in. Uh, we have a one more uh, in this quick one. What do we have? Yeah, let's check it out here. I think this is a, another recurring uh, caller. This is, I believe, Whooping Hooper. So let's give him a listen. All right. I have a missing spot. In my brain. I hope that's not true. Hey, dudes and dreads, it's the Whooper and Hooper. Um, I hope I'm not too late with this phone call because I got a bit of a tangential Zach Baggins story. Oh, perfect. Tell. So, about 10 minutes from my house, the next town over, there's a old tuberculosis hospital that is super haunted. Haunted enough for Zach and the Bag Boys to come check it out. And uh, while they were here, they stopped in at a coffee shop that my wife's best friend runs, and she said those guys were the douchiest, biggest jerks that she's ever uh, dealt with. I mean, they came in, ordered some super specific, fancy frou-frou coffee, which you can expect if you look at Zach's shirts. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, didn't really say, talk to anybody, was really rude to all the wait staff, and then didn't leave a tip. Wow. So, of course. You know, just to add some icing on that shitty cake, if anybody was still... <laughs> thinking that he might not be a sack of shit. He's rude to wait staff and does not tip. What a piece of shit. Those are anyway, huge. Uh, yeah. I haven't checked out the episode myself that it was filmed for, so uh, I probably should do that. Uh, that yeah. hospital is now an old bed and breakfast, which is cool. Um, fortunately, my house is haunted enough that I don't need to go somewhere else to experience ghosts, which is kind of fun. But if you guys ever want to come check out my cows, see what how beautiful southern Idaho is, it's not. You can come check out St. Battle <laughs> All right. Well, catch you later. Right. Wow. That is a tempting invitation. Old tuberculosis hospitals in Idaho. But yeah, great point Definitely. and great uh, segue to what we're going to get into. A, 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 a live action Zach Baggins story, Drea. Can you believe it? He they, They're actually shitty as real people. Yeah. You know what? I Wow. I'm totally floored to, to hear that. No, it's unfortunately one of those things where it's just corroborated by so many people. They're like, yep. And so it's not just people jumping on some bandwagon. He interacts with real people and like doesn't even think to, you know, to be nice to people. Like even uh, it's one thing to care about just your reputation, but just a common courtesy. Fuck. I could just imagine how obnoxious he is ordering whatever that foo foo drink is that he also mentioned. <laughs> what do you probably think he like <laughs> double shot chai matcha with soy and a. A uh, drop of oat milk uh, <laughs> and two splendid, uh, shaken, not stirred. Like you know what I mean. But and then, then also make it heavy cream somehow. Or yeah. <laughs> like annoying at the I end. I never I'm sure. said that. <laughs> Shut up, Zach. Yeah, you did. You and then you know that they that. spell his name wrong. You know they spell his name. Wrong I hope. Z A K. Maybe they, maybe they spell it S A K. That would actually be right. He does spell it Z A K. Anyway, I believe me. I've had to spell it enough to uh, post up for this show. But yeah, it's good to hear uh, some boots on the ground evidence of what we are about to get into. I'll I'll say let's get out of this. Thank you so much, everyone. That was it. that's it for the Unbelievers Voice Mailbag. 
The Unbelievers Mail 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 Bag. Ooh, right in the mail bag. Hey man, check your mailbox. Hey you got some new mail over here. Right. Mail bag. Mail bag. Mail bag. The mail bag is mail bag. cool. Mail bag. Sup bitches, it's mail time. Well, armed with that knowledge, let's move on to our third favorite segment. What's that, Drea? Poll results. This week's poll, and it is a big one. Does Zach Baggins belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? And much like any vote for SOS Hall of Fame, which is a distinctive honor that we that gets bestowed only on the worst of the worst of the paranormal. I mean, we've we've done a whole tournament of SOS on our Patreon. If you want to go on our Patreon where uh, we we pitted Joshua P. Warren against Willie Strebah, not Willie Strebah. There were lots of name some S O some of your favorite SOSs. Oh God, um, <laughs> Kathleen now Roberts. I'm drawing a blank. She was in there. there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Kathleen Definitely Roberts, uh, definitely some of the, in there. The uh, other channelers, there was a um, uh, what's her name? Uh, you know, in water, she's in water, honey. She was in there. She's definitely in there. There was there's Rampa, Jay Z Knight is in there. There's there you so go. Many people. There you yeah, go. that's what I was. Yeah, trying it's. It's actually great because it's like a walk down memory lane to listen to those tournament of SOS. Tom Biscotti, well, lots of Bigfoot SOS people got in there. There's classic clips, but then there's also like new clips for classic characters that kind of deepen the unbeliever lore. So yeah, if you haven't checked out the tournament on the Patreon, that's a great thing to go back and listen to. It was a lot of fun doing that, but I think we have to get into it tonight. This week's poll does Zach Bag is blowing the SOS Hall of Fame, and Mike. A lot of these uh, SOS polls, I, I wanted multiple, I wanted all the unbelievers to be able to chime in. This is a community vote. I first went to uh, Facebook with this and I asked Facebook and uh, overwhelmingly, the unbelievers on Facebook uh, voted that yes, Zach Baggins is a sack of shit. And I do have a couple of others from Facebook. We have... Hack Baggins took the sack of shit that the Warrens filled and filled it even further than a certain pair of pants. So saith a man called Host. Thank you, man called Host. Nice. Chiming in with his other. So that, that he votes for him. Everyone on Facebook, but we have another one here. He is a certified sack of shit. Always abusing his crew, berating his likely former ex-lover, Nick, and constantly <laughs> harassing ghosts with his EVP-ness. This guy is a creepa keepa. Sign <laughs> your friendly whooping hooper. Wow, That's whooping really hooper good. making yeah. a a really good <laughs> case. Yeah, he is. He, he's, man, calling. he's killing it from Idaho, man. He's got nothing to do but <laughs> just be great at being an unbeliever. And I love it. He is. And <laughs> so that was from Facebook. I also put the poll on Twitter. And from Twitter, it was not as anonymous uh, or unanimous as Facebook. With 89% of the vote, yes, he is a sack of shit. 11% said, no way, bro. He's cool. So <laughs> we did have we did have one other that from Twitter. Funny. And that is says... Uh, Zach and Nick were fighting over a Tessa flashlight. Happens to friends all the time. Signed, a Boner Yoger. Thank boner you. Yoger. I was almost expecting that to be a corrupted mask because it sounded like it could have been a corrupted mask one. But Boner Yoger really just being inappropriate. And I love it. It's great. So good at that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Boner Yoger. And I do want to mention that as we are doing this vote, much like when we recorded the episode uh, last time about Zach Baggins, it was Zach Baggins' birthday when we recorded that episode. Oh, yeah, right. Today, yeah. as we record this episode, it is Nick Groff's birthday, which <laughs> oh this God. makes no what? sense to me that their birthdays are this close and that we were recording. Oh, my God. What? Moment complete. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What? <laughs> so maybe this might be a gift to uh, Nick Groff. He might win this on his own birthday. But now we'll get to the actual poll, which was posted just a day ago. And uh, I'm going to ask you, Drea Mora, what do you think the unbeliever said? Yes. I, I think just it's going to be a slam dunk. All right. How about you, Rob? 
I'm pretty sure you just told us that they all said yes. Well, that was on Twitter and Facebook. This is the actual poll I'm getting to. <sighs> pretty sure that they're gonna be. It's gonna all be the same. Congratulations, <laughs> uh, Rob and Drea, with High only five, Rob. with forty percent of the vote. Uh, yes, Zach Daggins does belong in the SOS Hall of Fame. Wow. But of course. There are regular others. Does Zach Baggins belong to the SOS Hall of Fame? Yes, Zach Baggins is a real sack of shit. As real as this sk skull. Signed, oh, Aerosol Telfer. Aerosol Telfer. <laughs> and signed, yes. So he fucking did it. He did, thank you. Awesome. As real as the sk skull. Thank you so much to, uh, come on, got to find his name. Dick Likens and his friend, Aerosol Telford. Thank you. Thank you, friend, Aerosol Telfer. Does Zach Back is belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? Is it weird or what when I say monster girl slash boyfriend like a dog man or rabbit man? Signed, Destin Star. What? I have no idea what that means, but thank you, <laughs> Destin Star. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely weird. Thank you, Destin Star. Does Zach Baggins belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? Zach, give me a Snapple. Signed, <laughs> Mothman Father. Whoa, 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 whoa. Joan, give me a Snapple. <laughs> Thank you, Mothman Father. Does Zach club. Baggins belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? He belongs in the boiling pits of sewage, along with those who aren't anointed by the new revelation. Signed, God, 10 star general. Uh oh. Uh oh, wow. JC Wexer chiming in. Boiling pits of sewage at yahoo.com. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, God's 10 star general. He even he hates Zach Baggins. Does Zach Baggins belong in the Wait, SOS Hall of Fame? Hold on. I think we have a clip for that, don't we? Isn't there? Yeah, here yes, you go. there is. The third guy's 10 star, 10 star, 10 star general in the war against media pornography. There you go. Great God one, God's 10 star general. Does Zach Baggins belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? I don't know about Zach Baggins, but my old dad does. Signed. <laughs> Scared of my Scared dad. Of my dad guy. Yes, you called it. Good one. Does Zach Baggins belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? Fun name for the new Osborne and Nick Ghost Show Jack and Groff. <laughs> XO, yes. XO, Doo -doo yes. Bin Laden. Holy shit, you're in the lead. You're in the lead. Doo -doo Bin Laden. <laughs> Doo -doo Bin Laden. Jack and Groff. Perfect. Wow. Perfect. Oh my if, God. Perfect. If uh, both of their shows hadn't just been canceled because of Zach Baggins. Uh, does Zach Baggins blow in the SOS Hall of Fame? Oh, this is crazy. This is nuts. That anyone think <laughs> would think he doesn't belong in the SOS Hall of Fame. Signed. Taylor. Agreed. And that was it. That's a final one. A lot of people want to do the yes no voting this week. I don't that blame makes them. Sense. Yeah. That's an so important wait, one. He did that last one. That was a, this is nuts. This is so crazy. Yeah. Uh, we have that one. I know I do. It's in here somewhere. Oh, this is nuts. Something oh my gosh, this is so crazy. All right, so we've got so many great ones. I'm going to go over some of the ones from Facebook and Twitter. We had uh, Boney Gare with uh, Zach and Nick were fighting over a Tessa flashlight. Happens to friends all the time. Uh, we had uh, a man Gross. called Host with Hack Baggins took the sack of shit that the Warrens filled and filled it even fuller than a certain <laughs> pair of pants. Uh, that, that was some pants filling uh, stuff there, but that was a man called oh, Host. Yeah, we also had uh, Whooping Hooper with, he's a certified sack of shit, always abusing his crew, berating his likely former ex-lover Nick, and constantly harassing goes with his Evie penis. Evie penis <laughs> is uh, Wow, that's, that's really, a, that's that a great sign-off name if someone so wants to no, that, adapt Well, that. that was Whooping Hooper. This guy is the creep. I'm just saying. Someone out there needs to yeah, be somebody should use that as a <laughs> Someone great. should be Evie Penis. Sure. Yeah. This is from, yeah, he also said this guy is a creeper keeper. Thank you, Whooping Hooper. But we also had from the actual poll, we had Aerosol Telfer with, yes, Baggins is a real sack of shit, as real as this skull skull. We had Destin Star, is it weird or what when I say Monster Girl Boyfriend like a dog man or rabbit man? Or we had Mothman Father with Zach, give me a Snapple. We had God Sense Star General with, he belongs in a boiling pits of sewers along with those who aren't anointed by the new revelation. We had Scared My Dad Guy. I don't know about Sack Baggins, but my old dad does. We had a doo doo bin Laden with fun name for the new Osborne and Nick Go Show, Jack and Groff. Yeah, and ding, ding, ding. Finally, we had Taylor <laughs> with, oh, this is crazy. This is nuts. Did anyone think he doesn't belong in the SOS Hall of Fame? Uh, I'm going to ask you, Rob Oakey, who do you think won this week's poll? Uh, I think that the idea of Nick Groff and 
uh, Jack Osborne having a show together is amazing. I don't know how we didn't put those two together. That's like a dream matchup. Well, j- uh, because I think that that's what that's really what Groff needs is he needs someone who's even bigger than uh, than Zach. And I'm pretty sure Jack Osborne has been around longer than Zach has. And that kid just shits out shows like it's his job. So I just feel like the two of them should pair up. That's a great idea. And yeah, call it Jack and Groff. That's fucking amazing. I want to say, I do I do feel like they have crossed paths already. And the fact that when his show got canceled, his co-host ran to Jack Osborne immediately and started Portals of Hell. <laughs> so there is some crossover there. I don't know. What about you, Drea? Which, which one did you like? Um, I mean, shit. I really liked Man Called Host's uh, answer. Uh, I like that they included the Warrens in there. And talking about sex, uh, Whoop and Hooper really, it's between those two. I don't know, man. Yeah, they are really good. You had Man Called Hose, uh, Hack Bag, and took the sack of shit that the Warrens (laughs) filled. And filled it even fuller (laughs) than a certain pair of pants. Uh, I love that one, too. But uh, I'm going to actually, I think we got to go with Rob. I think Dudu Bin Laden... I think this is definitely your, at least your second or third victory. F- a fun name for the new Osborne and Nick Go Show, Jack and Groff, XOXO. <laughs> Congratulations, Dudu Bin Laden. You just won this week's poll results. And usually we are done here, but we are not. The poll is done. The unbelievers have decided. The unbelievers have pretty much unanimously voted Zach Baggins into the SOS Hall of Fame, but they are not the only vote involved here. We also get a vote in this. So a one of four, uh, Zach Baggins is in. I'm going to ask you, Rob Oakey, do you think Zach Baggins belongs in the hollowed halls of the SOS Hall of Hollowed Fame? Uh, You know... This is hard. I think Rob is going to be the one who's not going to. Like, Rob, you love Zach. You don't want this. I mean, it's love. It's a love-hate sort of. I love to hate him. And I I think for the content that he creates, like some of it at least, it's entertaining enough to uh, for me to not turn off when I put it on the television. Um, does that mean I like him? Not really. It means that like he's his sort of stuff scratches an itch for me, a particular itch that uh, you know every once in a while you <laughs> you feel like watching that sort of a thing. But um, in the past, I would have voted no just because you know we put him up there with people like Stan Romanek and uh, you know sure. other people who really Richard C. Hoagland, Joshua yeah, like, P. Warren, the- comparing him to those sort of people who are like really hurtful and like, you know, obviously not coming from any sort of a good place. Um, whereas Zach is like, you know, it's creating entertainment, but like after all this stuff with, with Nick, I feel bad for what Nick has gone through. Uh, it, you know, maybe Nick has also got some, his own things that he's not a great, he's not like the best person for, uh, he's got, you know, nobody's perfect. And I'm sure. Tessa and I have been doing this since we were little kids. Yeah. Yeah. He's not the I, best. He's not the best. But to kind of wrap it up and stop come kind of muttering on here, uh, I would say that yes. Wow. I would vote him in at this point. How many times can you get nominated? And at a certain point where there's smoke, there's fire. This man must belong here. He's been summoned multiple times. To- <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He is the only uh, person that has been nominated, gotten through it, and been nominated again for new information. So Rob says yes. So this is already uh, two votes are, uh, for Zach Baggins to be in the SOS Hall of Fame. Drea Mora, where do you stand on I- Zach Baggins? Pretty sure you know where I stand. On this, I don't think it's like a big surprise that I think he's a total sack of shit. All right. And look, I'm not even, look, it doesn't matter. I don't even need to vote. I don't need to go on record because congratulations, Zach Scared. Baggins, for being not only a overly bombastic and out of his mind paranormal host, but for being such a backstabber that you work behind the scenes to cancel any show that you look as competition and basically destroying the career of someone who once helped you to build this empire that you now sit atop (laughs) of. For all of these reasons and more, Zach Baggins, congratulations. You have now joined the SOS Hall of Fame and may God have mercy on your soul. Our 
should have ruined more uh, dramatic induction. But there we are. And since this has happened, we have been sent <laughs> a uh, an audio file from a listener of in. in the caveat was, if Zach Baggins is, is inducted to the SOS Hall of Fame, please play this. So, Rob, let's play this. I have not heard this yet. I am anxious to hear this. Let's hear it. Zachary Baggins, it is I, the devil. For your crimes of spectral harassment, psychic impersonation, possession fraud, sabotaging the career of your former co-host, and general ego fueled douchebaggery. I hereby sentence you to an eternity within the sack of shit all of fame. You bring great shame to your ancestors from the shire, and henceforth shall carry the new name Dildo Baggin. Whoa! <laughs> you horrible, horrible hobbit man. <laughs> As for Nick Groth, you have my sympathies. Even if you are more or less completely untalented, <laughs> I look forward to seeing your next original show, Ghost of My Career. Oh, <laughs> Was it? oh it's already canceled? <laughs> God damn, dude. God damn. <laughs> wow, why, oh. did, why did I even bother doing an induction? I should have just played that. Thank you so Amazing. Thank you so much. Rob, who sent that in? You have the uh, the email open. Who sent that in? That's that, our buddy, Unbeliever Maxwell. Thank uh, you, shout Unbeliever Maxwell. Shout out to the production Maxwell. value there. It sounded so great. Good. That, that was really funny. I love it. Perfect. Masterpiece. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And uh, congrats, Zach Baggins. And hey, happy birthday, Nick Groff. Uh, you got... Yeah. I'm sure this actually makes you happy that you're uh, the person trying to fuck you over in this world. Is yeah, I know. This is the best, the world of, best the gift we could give him on his birthday. The paranormal world world is kind of like a small town in itself so if someone out there is friends with Nick Groff you know maybe just send him a text put the link for this episode in uh, it just be but, like yo happy oh, birthday we bro. insult him so much more than we <laughs> this is a huge know, win for him idea. and I will support his stuff even though I'm not all about the uh, live love paranormal and the family whatever you, you're, you're definitely more digestible than Zach at this point and uh, thank you Everyone who participated and voted, and uh, that's it for this week's poll results. I don't know. Are we done? How do we do this? All right, we're coming to the end of the program. Before we go, Andrea Mora, do you have anything you would like to say or plug? Um, I guess I yeah, just follow uh, my other podcast, Spirits and Spirits Pod, um, on Instagram and. Uh, also, Jack's podcast, Snacking with Jack Pod, also on Instagram. It's all one word. It's fun stuff. And uh, just uh, fuck people like this, the, the turmoil in the toy box. Fuck that noise. Damn. Yeah, right? Get Hell a life. Satan. Hell Satan. Hell Satan, God, Satan indeed. How about you, Rob Oki? You got anything to plug besides Satan? Um, mm. Yeah, I'll say uh, check out my Instagram, at Rob Oki. Go give me a follow. And... You know, hit us up on the email. Send us an email and uh, tell us a story. Or if you got a topic you want us to cover that you think would be fun, we're always open to checking those out. We may not do it, but maybe we will. Who knows? Oh, so we're open. You, we're flexible. We're, we're open. Quick. So we send it on over. Yeah. Can't and, happen uh, if you don't email. And, uh, do that at unbeliever'spodcast at gmail.com. Sure, absolutely. And I will say, uh, go follow us on YouTube. I will say I have a, uh, a new YouTube show that I will be putting out on the Unbelievers feed. Uh, Russ Ryan's Unbeliever, uh, well, actually, Believer Skeptic, coming soon with some great guests and authors. Still working it out. He's still getting, he's still figuring out the intro, how it's going to go. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming very soon. I'm going to say May the 4th, there will be a live episode with Tim Swartz, who, who has a new book, who wrote the uh, Talking Mongoose Jeff book. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. The Unbelievers podcast host today were Drea Mora and me, Russ Ryan. Our producer and soundboard engineer is Rob Oakey. You can join our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Unbelievers Podcast. We have a new episode on Patreon coming very soon. You can follow the show on Twitter at Unbelievers Pod and Instagram at Unbelievers Podcast. Our Facebook group is the Unbelievable Podcast Network and check out our merch store at Tee Public. There's a link in the description. Our music advisor is Pandora3373. Our official composer and theme song creator is Unbeliever A.A. Ron, a.k.a. Aaron Schilb. Follow him on Instagram at the Aaron Schilb. Our official graphic designer and card maker 
Ford, who designed our logo is Raymond O'Well. Check out his work at P. Raven Creative on Twitter and Project Raven Creative on Instagram. Our official Guardian of the Bench is at Kraken Stacker. Our official Alien Bopper is Nunchuck Pop and from Patreon. Our official Reverend Doctor of the Podcast is the Non-Newtonian Druid. Our official Big Island Paranormal Friendly Weatherman is Green Finhawk. Our official Procrastinator is Jeffrey Hartner. Our official Baby Yoda Publicist is Bam Z. Our official Unbeliever listening between the stations for a message from Art Bell is Scott E. Our official Unbeliever Raising Puck Wudgies is Joe Filler. Our official Madman is Unbeliever Adam. Our official Unbeliever's Time Traveler is Taylor Nelson. Our official Snack is Jack S. Our official Ghost Hunter is Emilio Childs and Ghost Hunting in New England. Our official Senior European Correspondent is Kay Mill of the I Don't Know Podcast. Our official Paranormal Art Curator is Isis Haynes. Our official Rod is Rod Bell Lugosi. Our official Unbeliever in Need of Titles are Mike Henry, Todd X, Lid Vicious, Sandra and Deborah Foles, Ramiro, Trash Baby, Adam Dvorak, Wombat Preservationist. And this week's Unbeliever Focus is a Boner Yogair who has a newfound interest in Bigfoot erotica. Man, remember we talked about that way back when? So he is so into this, <laughs> so much so that he is ready to take it to the next level. People always want to take it to the next level. And he even <laughs> plans on bringing the missus out on a very special Sasquatch camping trip. And uh, when I asked how Mrs. Yogurt felt about all that, he said... <laughs> Brad, I've been trying to talk her into an interspecies relationship for months now. Whoa, <laughs> wait, all right, good night. <laughs>